either forbear, quit presently the chapel, or else prepare for further amazement, which then you will think I am possessed by wicked powers which I protest against. Garrick must have had that very famous scene from The Winter's Tale in mind when he constructed this octagonal temple and named it a temple to Shakespeare in 1758. He'd moved here in 1753 and the whole story of Garrick in Hampton is going to be described to you this afternoon by Rupert Nicholl, whose hospitality we're very grateful for, the events manager at Garrick's Temple. But the whole idea of a temple to Shakespeare and the Enlightenment, built in the Enlightenment, raises all kinds of questions about Shakespeare's status, Shakespeare's relationship to religion, that Garrick, perhaps more than anyone, as the son of a Huguenot refugee from a family that had fled France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, married to a Viennese ballerina who was a lifelong Catholic, must have been conscious of. The relationship between Shakespeare and religion makes the question of Shakespeare and the Enlightenment almost a tautology. But there's no uh, more appropriate, more apt, more crying out for us to consider that relationship than in this so-called temple, which like Paulina's statue scene in The Winter's Tale, ambiguously shifts between being an art gallery and being a chapel. Those of you who know the play, and you all know the play well, remember how the scene begins in a gallery and climaxes in a chapel. Garrick was conscious of the religious connotations when he called it a temple by inviting his friends to pay homage, and he used that word, to the statue that he commissioned from Jean-Francois Roubiliac, the greatest sculptor in England of his day, another French exile. And it's always said by art historians that the statue's indecisiveness, the Frenchified head, which doesn't seem to belong physiologically to the rest of the body, in some sense represents the contradictions of Garrick's own position as a Frenchman professing to be the most patriotic of Englishmen and a Huguenot married to a Catholic. And the whole complexity of Shakespeare and religion, more than perhaps any other image, we come to worship the statue which seems in its indecisiveness indeed to move as Garrick's own contemporaries came to this temple as he hoped they would to worship Shakespeare. We have in, sense, in some sense fulfilled Garrick's invitation by coming here like the characters in the Winter's Tale today. The temple perhaps has been waiting all these years, 200 years, for this, this moment. And it's especially appropriate, as Rupert Nichols said, that we should be doing this in the Shakespeare anniversary year. But for 200 years, the temple has been waiting, as Garrick hoped, for the philosophers of Europe to arrive in this building. Europe and, indeed, of the new world. Garrick hoped that the great and the good of the world would come to this temple. In the event, uh, none of the philosophers, including Voltaire, that he invited, ever did come to the temple the most illustrious guest in his own lifetime in 1768 was King Christian VII of Denmark, who at the age of 18 was already showing signs of the incipient madness that made him obsessive about the, the character of Hamlet. Two years later, he did indeed go mad, had his wife, the sister of George III, incarcerated and her lover horribly executed, the subject of many novels and a recent film. Madness stalked the temple and the place of reason. But the temple exists in a space between a number of texts which I'd like us to think about when confronting this question, this oxymoron of Shakespeare and the Enlightenment. What is the Enlightenment uh, was a question that from Kant through to Foucault and Habermas reverberates through 
European and world philosophy. And our speakers today are all qualified to address that question. In his own famous essay, What is Enlightenment?, Foucault himself confronts Vico's description of the Enlightenment as being, in some sense, a European project. He says that the Enlightenment is today the vision, this is Vico in The New Science of uh, 1744, so just a decade before this temple. The Enlightenment is the vision of a complete humanity spread abroad through all nations, but it is also Europe, radiant with such humanity that it abounds in all the good things that make the happiness of human life. Europe, radiant in all good things. And Foucault very characteristically confronts this with Plato's The Statesman, where he says the speakers recognise that they belong to one of those revolutions of the world in which the world is turning backwards. We who have just lived through the Brexit debate and the resulting referendum can understand the force of Foucault's juxtaposition of that marvellous vision from Vico of Europe abounding in all good things with Foucault's contradiction that we can indeed live through moments where the world is turning backwards. The revelation, perhaps the greatest shock of my lifetime, has been the realisation that the great European project is not all headed in one direction. And that brings the whole question, I think, of the Enlightenment to the forefront of our minds in relation to Shakespeare specifically. Between that text and the text of just a few years later, of 1773, um, this temple, by, by Herder, this temple full of its contradictions seems to be conscious of the quite contrary view of Shakespeare's position in, the, in relation to the Enlightenment that Herder announced in his 1774 uh, book, on, book on Shakespeare, um, where he writes that far from being a European, uh, Shakespeare is, uh, above all else, a man of the North, a nationalist, a northern man, a great poet of, of the Gothic North and of national English consciousness in particular. The book opens with a wonderful description um, of Shakespeare, which we might think about uh, in terms of this contradiction between reason and barbarism as we sit before Shakespeare's statue today where Herder begins by saying, seated high atop some craggy eminence, whirlwinds, tempest, and the roaring sea at his feet, but with the flashing skies about his head, that man is Shakespeare. Just up the road, of course, that vision of Shakespeare was being realised in brick by Horace Walpole, Garrick's neighbour at Strawberry Hill. We're very close here, not only to the Enlightened, but also uh, to the Gothic. 